a bit of an interesting challenge um, getting this into the sort of 25 and 20 seconds thing. So we'll see how it goes. It's the first time that I've done this. Um, it it's really is quite exciting to be presenting here. And um, for some background, this is based on my master's research at Newcastle University. And I'm coming to this from the background of being an archaeology student and a heritage studies student. It's not from a clinical background. It hasn't had that input. It's not about looking for a cure for autism, it's not about that kind of thing, it's about what we can do as archaeologists to make it, uh, workplaces better for people with ASD. The research also does not attempt or claim to offer any definitive answers. The recommendations that I've got at the end of this are intended to be discussed. The idea is that we work on them and uh, I hope that this the discussion at the end of this can pull out some of that. Um, firstly, a quick little bit of background on autism. It's kind of generally considered to be first identified as a condition by Leo Kanner and Hans Asperger in the 40s, around the same time. They both identified a desire for sameness, aloneness. Kanner, unfortunately, also sort of continually talked about his patients as not being normal or ordinary and that kind of thing. Through the impact of uh, World War II and Hans uh, Asperger publishing in Germany during that time, a lot of his stuff was ignored, so the focus was on Kanner. And he, like I said, didn't consider people, his patients to be normal, he began looking for people to blame, like the mothers, which leads us to Bruno Bettelheim and the refrigerator mother theory, which was basically saying that it was because of <laughs> the coldness of mothers that autism happened. He was not a psychologist, he doctored his, um, he made up his credentials when he arrived in the States, so he wasn't even a psychologist. But there's been huge impact from that kind of stuff because for years a lot of research around autism has been looking for what's the cause, what's the blame, all that kind of thing, until the last few years when you've had the neurodiversity movement. You get groups like Aspies for Freedom, who are really kind of uh, autistic pride kind of thing, and also Neurodrives have popularised this as well. So there is some change happening. To link it to archaeology, I think we can all agree that archaeology and heritage can have a huge impact on people's lives. It can help to shape identity and that kind of thing. And archaeology, in my view, I think is the closest that we ever get to heritage, very physically, as nicely demonstrated by my Maltese college colleague with his legs sticking out of a tomb. I think if we recognise that we can shape people's identities and we have that power, then it's also good to recognise that that can have a really positive impact on the lives of people that are sometimes ostracised. The work of Operation Nightingale with past soldiers, past in mind in Herefordshire with people who are mental health care service users and archaeologists for autism in the States all do really fantastic work. But what I'm looking for isn't just single projects. I rather want to consider how in archaeology we can be a consistently positive workplace for people with ASD. The research here was based on semi-structured interviews with 16 people, so that's not huge, but you know it's been interesting, covering experience in care sector, research work, archaeology, and um, people with ASD, and in quite a few cases people covered one or two or even three of those fields, so there was a bit of crossover going on. Four the key themes came out, that is resources and provision for adults with ASD, issues around diversity within ASD itself. Um, concerns around social difference and anxiety that often comes with that for people with ASD, and also the sort of general public understanding of this. For each of these themes, I thought I'd let some of the respondents do the talking because it's gone quite well. They say it much better for me. On resources, we know very little about adults on the autistic spectrum. We know very little about what happens after the transition from child to adult services. There isn't that support there. This is particularly the case when people are moving into work, so there more often than not isn't a certain kind of support structure within the workplace for people with autism or other mental health conditions. On diversity, there's an idea that there's a black and white view that says high functioning people are capable and low functioning people aren't. The truth is that categorizing the abilities and skills of people is not that easy. Like every neurotypical individual is different, and like everybody in this room is completely different, every adult with autism is different. So you can't just be grouping people in one thing and saying, well, there's a fix-all kind of thing. On social difference and anxiety, it can be very difficult to engage cold with people. The nature of engaging in society is largely a performance on society's terms. Autistic people do not have social deficits. They simply socialise differently. This is a really important point as well that's come up quite a lot. 
And as some, one person said, if I'm not making eye contact or seem awkward, it's nothing personal and it's not because I don't like and respect the person that I'm talking to. It's just socialising differently. And whilst understanding and awareness of autism and the issues around it has increased dramatically in the last 10 years, autistic people are generally required to accommodate the mainstream in order to access inclusion. If they want to be part of what they're expected to cover it up and conform to society, that's not inclusion, that's just forcing people to change. But that's not inclusion to me. I see this as an opportunity, though, for archaeology to be proactive and to open up job opportunities for adults with ASD. Recognize, by recognising the individuality across ASD, and also through speaking to staff and other archaeologists about the condition, um, ensuring a strong knowledge of the often really small changes that we can make, that make a huge difference in making it a really positive workspace. These can be really, really tiny things. It can be things like letting somebody always use the same plates and mugs. It can be giving people time to respond to questions, speaking clearly and avoiding sarcasm. It can be keeping a very relatively fixed structure. These things wouldn't have an impact on the progress of a dig. They're very simple, small changes that you need to make. Most importantly, these changes would need to take place throughout the dig. So you'd be going from prior planning right the way through to sort of continued support. So before a dig is starting, you're looking at discussing needs with participants, distributing detailed and often visual plans rather than just having things in text, having open discussions with staff about autism and the kind of things that people can do to make it a more comfortable workspace and requirements within the workspace. When a dig is starting, if you have somebody, one of the supervisors on a dig who could be designated as a mentor, somebody that people can go and talk to if necessary, identify safe spaces which people can take breaks if they need to. You can provide sensory aids, visual aids and guides to those people that want them. It's all quite small stuff, as I say, and you just follow a consistent structure as you go on. So throughout the dig, you're keeping it consistent, you're being clear and concise with instructions, you're avoiding sarcasm, and all that kind of thing. But on top of that, there's no need within what is quite a social workspace often in archaeology to avoid that. There's no need to be completely avoiding the social dynamic because people more often than not will want to interact. And if you have the other support structures in place, then it can be really conducive for that to happen. I think that we're, like, in archaeology, we're a relatively small vocation. But I believe we're very well placed to take a lead in providing a really positive workspace. We can be openly, vocally and proudly supportive of adults with ASD and just by doing some relatively small things. So I look forward to the discussion and seeing what people think of it. Thank you. Thank you.